look at the camera with uh, with the red light. I'm looking at the camera with the red light. Uh, the fellow I'm talking to is Dr. Andrew Howard. He's an astronomer. That means a professor at IFA. And IFA, everybody, everybody knows what IFA is. <laughs> IFA is the Institute for Astronomy. Astronomy, and everybody knows where it is too. They know that it's not on the campus. This is a very important point. It's on Woodlawn Drive. There's probably a benefit in that. What do you think? Well, we're closer to Manoa Marketplace. We have better restaurants. <laughs> <Okay. there. laughs> so, Andrew, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm glad thanks, to be here. Thanks for coming down. You were you were great. Uh, a star? Can I use that term in multiple meanings? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> you were a star in our program about uh, Hawaii, the state of science, uh, what in uh, January, and um, it was really an interesting program because we found we found that there were multiple disciplines, but there were common points about research. And I, and I think that, that kids, because it's always addressed to kids, um, kids need to know that there, there are common denominators in research. And they should know those things when they make their ultimate choice mm -hmm. about what, what area of science they want to study. So I learned a lot. And uh, you were instrumental in that. Um, Dave Carl is always instrumental. He was terrific. He's, well, he would have got, he's one of our directors, you know, our yeah. corporate director. Anyway, so I wanted to follow up on that discussion. I wanted to talk more about, uh, you know, uh, what you said that you were a, a planet hunter and find out how you do that. <laughs> 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 and uh, we're calling this Tales of a Planet Hunter uh, an astronomical subject. <laughs> Very good. In space. We are in space, calling home, <laughs> phoning home from space. Okay, so I asked you before the show, I, you know, I said, uh, so I've been thinking about this question. Uh, if, if all of astronomy stopped and nobody ever studied it again, nobody ever, you know, did any planet hunting, uh, how would it affect us? Well, so uh, this question reminds me, it makes me think about, um, I think it was during the Cold War, the director of Fermilab was called before Congress and he was asked the same question, you know, what, is, what are these physics good for? I, what do you do for the national defense? And he paused for a moment and thought about it and said, well, we don't do a single thing for the national defense except that we make the country worth defending. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of science like that that you, you don't really know where it's going, but it's, it's beautiful in its own right, and in his history shows us that it leads to untold applications. Yeah, that's like going to the moon. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't important in terms of advancing, well, I guess it, it had benefits in terms of advancing some sciences. It was a laboratory, among other things. But the important thing was we could do it. Yeah. And so the same with astronomy. We can reach out beyond, far beyond. We can see into the heavens. There's something really, so is that why you went into this? There's certainly a, there's a huge curiosity aspect, wanting to figure out how the world works, wanting to figure out what's out there, maybe even what life is out there and it's it's amazing I find it remarkable that we live in a time when people can actually answer that question you know people have wanted to know this answer for thousands of years and we're the generation that might figure it out we had a fellow sitting in that chair a few weeks ago who is operating a project to raise money and um, send a mission out to determine whether there's life out there it's a very ambitious project yeah and of course you know a certain percentage of the people in the world are gonna say ah come on um, but, you know, maybe there is. What do you think? Do you, do you have a sort of an inclination on this question? Well, so some of this is kind of a litmus test, and I come down as an optimist. But the scientist in me would say, you know, there's a bunch of, let's say, physical conditions that had to be met on the Earth for life to arise. And as we look out at the cosmos, what we see are we're checking off the boxes for one after one conditions. We see that planets, are, are common, stars are common, planets, even the size and the temperature of the Earth are common. And so we think there's probably a lot of starting places for life, and there's certainly a lot that still has to go right, and that's a lot of, that's the work of science now, is to try to figure out, uh, among other things, if those other planets could go right for life. So the way it happened here, I mean, which is not really an astronomical subject, but the way it happened here is a cell was born. The right combination of elements came together, and bingo, a cell was born. But before we get into the religious aspect of that, <laughs> okay, um, is, is it, when you, when you ideate this possibility of life elsewhere, is it the same kind of process that you have elements and they somehow, by accident, come together and they touch each other a certain way so that one yeah. cell is born? 
Well, so these things don't happen necessarily, we think they don't happen by, you know, by magic wand or by religious fiat. We, you know, you, if you break it down finer and finer, the first thing that probably happens is you form complicated molecules. And eventually these molecules are able to self-replicate like our DNA and RNA can do now. And there's some theories about how this happened. You have to bring together the other pieces of the equation. Our cells also replicate in addition to the molecules inside us. So there's people trying to figure out, building very simple physical systems to recreate each little step in this process. We haven't put it all together, but there's a lot of people, myself included, who are confident that we'll probably get some physical understanding about you know, how this process happened. We aren't there yet. I think, I think it'd be, it could be duplicated. I mean, here on Earth, you think I could put those molecules, I could create those molecules without help now, <laughs> without bringing some, you know, some life into the picture, sort of dead elements uh, that sort of generate molecules and then a cell. Is it, you think this can be done by... Maybe, it's hard to know. It hasn't but, been done yet. Uh, no, it hasn't been done. The, so one of the things that the challenge is, you know, on the Earth, the beginning of the Earth, there was millions of years for this to happen over, and there was the whole Earth's surface for this to happen over. And that's a lot bigger and longer time than a laboratory. So there's probably a, there's still a big element of chance to it, I think. And the Wouldn't key in the laboratory that, yeah. is to pick up out the small parts and, and see how we can kick it in the right direction. Yeah, well, that's pretty exciting as a, as, a, as a point of reference in your thinking and your research. Yeah. Uh, to find a common denominator, to think it out there somewhere I mean, it wouldn't be exactly the same process. That's not likely, but some kind of process. Well, that's one of the interesting questions. Yeah. If we ever do discover another instance of life, maybe another instance of, of uh, intelligent life, I would want to know, do you have the same biochemistry? Yes. Is there a universal divergence so that maybe amino acids and proteins just had to be the way, there's no other solution in the universe. Yes. Or maybe DNA happened to be, or maybe there's some other solution we haven't even thought of. Yes. That's a really fascinating I'll question. I'll give you a, a theory though that just comes to mind now sitting here with you is that it was fairly remarkable that life developed in this place. I mean, and you had to wait millions of years and the chances were not great at any moment, but little by little through a bunch of accidents, a cell, okay? Could it be that in all of the universe, you know, it's the only time it happened. That it is so, the chances are so infinitesimal, it only happened here. It never happened anywhere else, and that we're it. You know, I get asked this question a lot, and one, one way I like to answer it is, I can't think of another physical phenomenon that we have just a single example of. We always see multiples, because there's always many possible places for these things to happen, and, they, and the physics and chemistry are universal. So while there, there's certainly a probability associated with it, there's an odds of it going right, it would surprise me if it only happened once. Yeah, interesting. Now, I was going to ask you, to, to reel back on the religious thing, I was going to ask you, you know, if, as an astronomer, I mean, I'm not an astronomer, I couldn't even show you the Big Dipper, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe I should go back to My school. constellations <laughs> are weaker than you might imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but, <clears throat> you know, when you're out there, and when, you, when you're living and breathing and thinking all day about the universe and universes beyond the universe and all that, um, th don't you have to make peace on the question of who started this? Don't you have to make peace on the question of whether there's some intelligent being that's running the operation? I mean, how do you deal with that as an astronomer? I'm sure that no two astronomers would answer it the you same You know, there's way. people, people have differences of opinion. I, I, for me, I think we're looking for a physical answer. There's, we know that the Big Bang, and we have this whole picture of how it started, and we have good evidence for that. And I, I think the physicists are hard at work to maybe figure out why that happened. There's this idea called the multiverse that might partially explain it. Let's but, see Alex Filipenko. Say. Yeah, I think Alex was talking about that a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, but for me, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have answers to the questions that I think are within our grasp. Yeah, so you don't have to go there. You can deal with it as a science, period. Yeah, and you know, this might not be the idea that we need to know how and who created the universe, that might not be a question that has a proper answer in the way that we're used to. Yeah, let's figure out the other stuff first. Yeah. <laughs> well, so yeah, and then uh, I, I'm just to identify Alex Filipenko. Um, Alex Filipenko is a teacher at Berkeley, um, and uh, that's where Andrew went to school. I was a postdoc there. Postdoc there. 
Uh, for me, it all blends yeah, together. Yeah, it's all part know. of the continuum. We'll talk about your school. Uh, anyway, uh, he was here uh, se several weeks ago, and he, he spoke at the Kennedy Theater, and he spoke about, the, I think, the multiverse. I think he, something about the multiverse was in, was in his speech. And the remarkable thing I took away from that was how little I understood. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was not easy. It was a lot of physics. And at the end of the program, and this is the part that blew me away, I was telling you, these kids, six or seven years old, came running up to ask him questions. And I couldn't even understand the questions, much less the <laughs> answers. <laughs> and I wasn't alone in this yeah. matter. It was a really incredible speech, and it took you soaring through the heavens. So <clears throat> what is it about Alex Filipenko? I mean, uh, he's, he's famous. And yeah. he, he won all kinds of awards for being a popular teacher, but what is it about him? Alex has a, a way of communication that he, he's, especially for the classes that he teaches, he's really honed his message and figured out how to deliver just that key nugget that makes, that makes the concept sink in. I, I admire him a lot for that. Yeah. So people take his class for that? Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, it's uh, tens of thousands of students over the years have taken his class. That's not because they're going to be astronomers or physicists. No, this is a, this is a class for non-science majors. Yeah, interesting. Anyway, uh, to go back to your education, so you're a postdoc at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. and you told me at some point that uh, all your training is in, is in physics, physics, astrophysics, right, yeah. all that. Um, can you talk about um, you know, the decisions you made to take that, that path? That's a good question. So I, I started off in college. I was at MIT. I was a physics major. I, in part, this was uh, kind of what I had been exposed to. I wanted to figure out how the universe works, and physics was the way you did that. And, I continued on in graduate school, and I chose to specialize in um, uh, SETI in graduate school. So this is kind of this is a very unusual path, and this is kind of part of observational astronomy of, of astrophysics. So I I learned how to use telescopes and build telescopes and instruments and so forth. And and SETI this is a, the, again the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We were my graduate thesis was looking for signals from other civilizations. So we were looking for these nanosecond light flashes that can be sent across the cosmos, don't look like any other natu any natural phenomenon, and would signal that ET is out there. Now, if we had found something, you and I would be having a very different conversation right now. Um, but these questions about life out there have always deeply interested in me. And I, I still support SETI enormously, but as a professional career choice, I decided to make a kind of subtle distinction and, and start working on searching for planets, um, which is a less of a kind of all or nothing activity. We can make progress. We find planets frequently around other stars. We can learn about their properties. We refine our knowledge. We can test our hypotheses. SETI is, uh, SETI is wonderful. For me personally, it's a challenge because it's, it's all or nothing. Yeah. Could be the really big time. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of big time, we're going to take a short break. <laughs> it's little time. Okay. It's uh, Dr. Andrew Howard, astronomer, professor at IFA, the Institute for Astronomy. We're talking about research in Mano. We're talking about tales of a planet hunter. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. Hi, aloha. My name is Chris Leatham, and I have host a show called The Economy and You. Uh, the show plays every Wednesday at noon, and on my show, I bring on guests who are interested or working in the technology space, and uh, so I'd like you to come and watch the show and learn with me about all the sort of exciting things that we're doing in Hawaii to build and grow our economy ecosystem. So I'd like to say aloha, and I look forward to seeing you on the show. Thank you. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel here on a Monday with Andrew Howard, astronomer at IFA. We're talking about research in Manoa. We're talking about research in the heavens. We're talking about the tales of a planet hunter, Andrew Howard. So there was, on this uh, program about science in Hawaii, there was a, a, a kid. It was a sophomore, I think, at Iolani. Yeah. 
um, 15 years old, and uh, it wasn't this year, it was last year when he was 14 years old, that he got an award at the science fair for having invented, or rather discovered a planet, an exoplanet with some long, complicated name. Yeah. Um, so, query, what is that? What is an exoplanet, and what does it mean to discover an exoplanet? Yeah, so, first of all, it's absolutely remarkable, his achievement, and I, you know, I look back at my 15 and 16-year-old self and wonder <laughs> about how, how a person could be that talented at such a young age. So let's talk about exoplanets. So our own, you know, we now know of eight planets in the solar system. It used to be nine, but we can talk about Pluto later if you'd like. And, you mean Pluto uh, is not in the solar system? Pluto is, we call it a dwarf planet now. Nothing's changed about it, but we call it a dwarf planet. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is it, you mean it used to be bigger? No, it's always been the same size. This is just a demotion, I guess. Oh, you could say, okay. or a renaming. The science changes the perception. Of yeah, it. and that's a whole interesting <laughs> story. But so our own solar system provides a context. We've got the eight planets, and what they have in common is they all orbit the sun, a, a star, in our Milky Way galaxy. So if we look out at the other stars in the Milky Way galaxy, we can ask the question, do those other stars have planets that orbit around um, their central stars, and maybe they're a whole planetary system? And that's indeed what we found over the last almost 20 years now, and there's a couple different techniques that we could get into them if you'd like, about how, how we actually find these planets. But the planets have been there, for, you know, in many cases for billions of years. They're so faint, you can't actually see them in most cases. How far you can are just they? Well, you know, the nearest stars are a few light years away. So we're talking, you know, it takes a radio signal or a light pulse takes years to get there. The fastest spaceship probably take 1,000 years, maybe 10,000 oh years. Oh, boy. So we're talking, these are astronomical distances, but these are also our nearest neighbors. So many of the stars that we've discovered planets around are nearby. Some are a little farther away. So far, we think all of the planets that we know of are within our Milky Way galaxy, the collection of a hundred billion or so stars that all orbit around each other and around a black hole in the middle. And there are, of course, many other galaxies out there. There's a black hole in the middle of each one of these systems? Well, we, at least within our Milky Way. Okay. Maybe, our Milky Don't Way draw any galaxies. big conclusions on it, yeah. <laughs> some, I think some of my colleagues would say that the, all galaxies have black holes oh, in the middle of them. But, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. I heard a thing, just to, not to digress too far, somebody on NPR was talking about black holes and what would happen to you if you fell in a black hole with the absence <laughs> of gravity and you'd turn into toothpaste, he said. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, so here, here's a great physics term. This is a real term. Spaghettification. <laughs> okay. So it turns out that the tides on a black hole are so strong that if you're going in head first, your head gets pulled so much more than your feet do that you get stretched into spaghetti, essentially. <laughs> so, you know, no one's ever seen this, but that's the process that happens. Okay. All right, so here we have these other gal gal galaxy, or no. You, these are, are other stars. Other that have, stars. Have planets orbiting them. And those planets orbiting them are exoplanets? Yeah, so they're called anything outside of the sol exosolar system we call an exoplanet. Sometimes we call it an extrasolar planet. They're and all they, the same thing. Very faint. You can hardly see them. Yeah, so the planets, you know, the planets don't have their, their own intrinsic light. Stars shine, and we see the planets in our own solar system because the light from our sun reflects off of those planets and then makes its way back to the Earth and we see them. Yeah. Um, these make planets around other stars much, much fainter because the whole thing is so much farther away. So actually seeing the points of light of these little planets going around their stars, that's extremely difficult. It's been done in a few cases. We mostly use some indirect techniques and we use um, a, a couple techniques that aren't that hard to understand. You know, one of them is this, we essentially look for eclipses. So if the, the central star is, is right here, we, we look for planets that go around the star, and if their orbit is tilted just right, they'll pass in front of their star as seen by the Earth. And we the see, silhouette then. Yeah, so we see the star dim a little bit as it, the planet blocks a fraction of its yeah. light. It's, it's an eclipse. And it repeats over and over and over again every time the planet goes around. So, but, but it's a telescope. You're yeah, so we a use a telescope. It's just use, a matter of how you use it. Yeah, so this is, we measure the star's brightness very precisely um, over and over again and look for these, these dimmings, these uh, eclipses of planets. Is that what he was doing? So that's what Chris Lindsay did. Um, so he uh, looked for data. There's a, a couple spacecraft that have, have been good at doing this. One is called the Corot spacecraft, and he used data from Corot. And the Corot astronomers weren't, 
entirely sure of what to make of all of these signals. There's a few ways that you can fool yourself into this kind of, this kind of signal. And he did the hard work of, of vetting this candidate, using other telescopes to observe it, and, and prove pretty strongly that this is uh, a planet and not something else. It always amazes me when, you know, kids and regular people and scientists, they want big data now. There is big data. You pick up the phone and you say, excuse me, I like the big data department. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get telescopic big data, millions of, millions of, uh, of records and fields and gosh, everything. And you can have that. That's just amazing. Here's a 15-year-old kid at the time, 14. Yeah. And he can go get the data from the, the Corot to do this relatively advanced work. Yeah. Uh, what is the telephone number for the big data company? <laughs> well, NASA.gov is a good website, oh, okay. website yeah. to start on. Yeah. So do you use the same techniques? Do you use the same, you know, NASA.gov? I do. So I mean, most <laughs> of the data that we, that we look at is, is, I use a data from a different telescope called the Kepler telescope. And these, these data are all public. If you want to find them, just Google search for Kepler and follow the links and you can, you can download the data. And so the, you know, the name of the game is, in some sense, we're, we're astronomers, but we also have to be computer scientists a little bit. So we have to write sophisticated algorithms to try to figure out when these measurements tell us that, hey, that this time there was a planet going in front of the star. And if you wait a few weeks later, it went around again. A few weeks again, it went around. And so we have to tease apart these signals. So mathematics is directly related to astronomy. Yeah, I mean, astronomy is a, it's a physical science. So we, we're all trained in physics and mathematics. And uh, you know, almost all of us are, are computer programmers, too. This is, but see, I, I want to I catch that connection. This isn't the kind of thing where you walk down the block to the mathematics department and say, we have a, we have a you know, a, a astrophysical question here, and we like some mathematics. Because you have your own brand of mathematics. And well, you know, the mathematics department doesn't necessarily. Most our day to day, we're, we're mostly self sufficient, but what we're trying to do more, especially at UH, is consult between departments because there's, there are people who are capable of building instruments that we can't do. There are people who, can do, who are far better at writing algorithms, computer scientists, mathematicians. And so we're trying to do a better job of consulting with them on a regular basis. Yeah, I, you know, I, I was talking to Sung Choi of the uh, School of Engineering about this, and, you know, uh, in, this, in this very chair. <laughs> and, um, you know, he's telling me that, you know, the engineers can build anything. They can, and you, you were talking before about when you were a kid, you, you were fascinated with telescopes. You built telescopes. Um, but right now, today, if you were going to do some cutting edge thing that involved sort of an advanced telescope, would you build it yourself, or you, would you call the School of Engineering and, and ask their, them to build it? I mean, it seems like they have, engineers are machers, you know, they make things. Um, is, it, is, it, is it efficient for an astronomer to build a telescope, or should he ask the engineers to do that? Yeah, so, you, I mean, basic question is, are we generalists or specialists? And the answer is we're specialists. And so even within astronomy, there are people who study different sub-disciplines. And one of those sub-disciplines is we call it instrumentation. So these are people whose, whose careers are defined by building the next great camera or spectrometer or something to measure a property of stars and In that and field planets. of science. Yeah. And those, those folks are, are expert at all of these engineering techniques. And they're, in, in many cases, kind of a bridge to other engineering disciplines that we like to collaborate with. So it sounds like as science gets more specialized, and it's pretty specialized already, uh, you want an engineer who is steeped in that science and then he applies his engineering approach within that science and does something that a regular engineer might not know how to do. Yeah, so you know things that are important in, the, in astronomy, it's not all of engineering, like civil engineering say is not really our cup of tea. Um, yet we have optics experts. We have people that are experts in thermal control, so making sure that your gizmo doesn't, when it warms up, it doesn't flex a little bit in one direction or the other. That could screw up your measurement. So we have people that are, that are uh, instrumentation experts, uh, real astronomers, that this is what they do all day long. They worry about how to build the next great instrument that will enable discovery. Well, you know, that, that's another question. I'm sorry, I'm just jumping around. So I'm, you're making me very curious. <laughs> so if I study physics, astrophysics, I'm learning about physics. If I study 
building telescopes and building the best telescopes that you know that you can find to do certain metrics. Um, that's fine. But it's but it seems to me that in the process you're learning things that can be used in other fields. You know, completely different fields. I mean, the lessons of space undoubtedly have a secondary lesson here, and the lessons of the you know telescopes have a have a secondary benefit in optics and some other area. I think they do. Right. There's synergy that goes back and forth between uh, the, you know, the applications of science and pu sort of pure science, astronomy being, being a classic example. And we do go, do go back and forth. Yeah, so it's, well, when you, when you go to the engineers and say, please help me build a telescope, that's one thing. That's, that's the fourth. But the back is what I'm interested in. So now you've built a telescope. You've gone further than the engineers ever went. Now, they or somebody in some other specialty should know what you've done for the benefit of another specialty. How do they find out that you've just invented some device that can be used elsewhere? Do they have to scour the literature? Yeah, I mean, so the, the ho we hope that this happens, the literature is one way, but this, a lot of times this happens interpersonally. You know, the people know each other, there's communication at meetings, at universities, people talk to each other, and so these ideas diffuse kind of how we're talking right now. A little bit more naturally, and to be sure, there's there's people do literature searches and look for the papers that were written. But I think uh, science and astronomy, in particular, is a human discipline, and so we rely on those human uh, connections. Yeah, uh, we're gonna have to take a break, but I when we come back, I want to tell you about the uh, this this uh, this this great science center, it's pharmaceutical center in Denver. Uh, it's called the New Fitzsimmons. It used to be a hospital. At uh, Army Hospital, just like Tripler, hmm. and then they turned it, maybe 20 years ago, they turned it into a, a pharmaceutical research place. And uh, I talked one time to the guy who did that, who's able to get big pharma to come from all over the country. Hmm. Hmm. I'm going to tell you his secret Okay. right after this break. That's Andrew Howard. He's an astronomer at IFA. We talk about research in Manoa. We talk about tales of a planet hunter. We haven't gotten to the actual hunting yet. We, we have time for that. Good. And it's an astronomical subject. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the the basis of what's right, what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. We're back. We're live. We're here with Andrew Howard uh, of IFA. And I just wanted to, you know, apropos to this whole thing about exchanging new ideas among disciplines in science, I, I'll tell you about New Fitzsimmons. It was, it was only um, an idea to have this pharmaceutical gathering place. And this one guy, remember his name right now, was in charge of it. And um, he, he decided he had to get them to talk to each other. They weren't talking to each other. And, and you, you want scientists to feel that a given location is the mecca, then you have to get them to talk to each other. It's, 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 a, it's a missing link. Mm -hmm. And um, so he set up breakfast meetings every day and gave them a really nice breakfast and let, some, let, let them speak you know, at a podium about their science. Sort of like what we did at, at uh, Lani Akea. Yeah. Tell us about your science. Yeah. And they loved it, and they weren't worried about, you know, um, intellectual property rights, anything like that. They were talking to their, their, their colleagues, their peers. And as a result, it sort of germinated this whole ethic there, a culture at the New Fitzsimmons, where it really worked because they were sharing ideas. Mm -hmm. and, and food. That was, <laughs> That's always like lubricant. You know, so, I mean, I, I think that may be missing 
to some extent at UH. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote a piece once to use the president's house as a gathering place for scientists. Um, but they're, you know, how does that work? How, am I right? Is it important? And how can it be accomplished? You know, it's, it's utterly important. And I actually spent a lot of my time traveling to, to meet with people. And I have collaborators in projects that are happening all over the world. Astronomy, we're kind of lucky here in Hawaii. We're naturally blessed. Um, the summit of Mauna Kea is maybe the world's greatest site for astronomy. Maybe, so maybe even the best site in the whole solar system. Yeah, yeah. And so people come here. This, this is where we have the site of many of the world's great telescopes. You know, the national telescopes for Japan, France, Canada, other uh, countries, they build their facilities here. And so this is a place where people and ideas and, and instruments congregate. And in that congregation, good things happen. So I, I sometimes think that we should try to take that natural advantage and create it in other areas of science or technology or engineering in Hawaii, and I think you know we could be a center for yeah. uh, for learning. Yeah, because I mean, if you can get people to gather, then it, it creates a secondary benefit, a secondary power, and and, and uh, Mauna Kea is is that yeah. all by itself naturally yeah. it's wonderful. So I wanted to, I wanted to ask you um, about you know your life as a planet hunter. I mean, it's, uh, maybe they can make a little TV serial about <laughs> you get in your SUV, you know, and you take certain equipment and go out and hunt planets. <laughs> sort of like bounty hunter, planet hunter. Yeah. You know? <laughs> How do you do this? Well, so I explained one of these techniques before that, you know, we, we look for the signal of a planet passing in front of a star, and we have, we have another technique where we look for the planet to tug on its host star gravitationally, so as the planet orbits around the star, the star is also undergoing a little orbit, and although we can't see the light from the planet, we can see the this orbit of the of the star, and, and we can infer the presence of the planet. So the sense in which we're, we're planet hunters is that um, we typically get some hint that a particular star has a planet, and we think we know the properties of it. And so it's a hunt in the sense that we go back to the telescope and make one more measurement, one more measurement, until we're finally convinced that it's the real thing and we know the the orbit of this planet, its mass, and maybe even its size. And then you write it up. Then we write it up, then we share it with the world. And um, There's kind of a, in this planet hunting business, there's kind of a dual aspect. We, we're trying to discover and catalog the planets, but we're also trying to make sense of them. One of the great things about extrasolar planets is that we can move beyond just the solar system where we know of a single example suddenly we've got 10, 20, 40, 100, 1,000 examples of planetary systems. And we can ask questions like, is our Earth common? Is the size and temperature of our Earth something that happens commonly around other stars? And if it's common, well, how common? You know, 10%, 30%? Turns out we just learned about a year ago, it's 20%. About 20% of stars near the sun have a planet that's about the same size and about the same temperature as the Earth. Well, that, that can help you examine those other systems. Yeah. Well, this, I mean, it's, this kind of gets, it's an interesting scientific question that tells us something about how planets form, but it's also an interesting philosophical question. It gets at maybe how many Earths are out there. Did you ever have the feeling, Andrew, that we here in this, in this world that you study, we're actually on an atom somewhere in somebody's fingernail? And that, you know, it's like an infinite continuum from we're an atom and then they're in an atom and then they're in an atom it's like groundhog day it just goes round and round <laughs> you know i don't i don't get too worried about that one the one you know the the thing that's uh, maybe hard to disprove is that we're in some extremely sophisticated computer simulation but <laughs> but you know it feels just as good to be here as in the real world so and they know what we're doing. It's like uh, the uh, the Truman Show. Yeah. I mean, people watching you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's scary. Yeah. <laughs> so, but but actual science and um, you know making those measurements and writing those uh, articles. What what article is good for IFA? What is what, what's uh, an astronomical? Uh, I'm sorry. Well, an we, astronomical. Yeah. So we there, we have we have certain specialty journals. The yeah. Astrophysical Journal is a is a premier journal. There's. Astronomical Journal, Icarus, a handful of others. And there's also kind of general science journals, like Nature is one, Science is another. Well, you cross the line. It could be at astronomy or a number yeah, of Yeah, these are kind of seen, these are journals that are read more broadly, and so it's, 
you want. To, if, if you're able to, it's good to have your results published there. Yeah, so it's good to publish. I mean, everybody knows, but how often is it good to publish? As often as possible. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's kind of a rat race aspect of it that people are expected to publish. But I, my own view is that you should do good science. You should write up your results when it's appropriate, and then kind of all the rest of it will fall into line. We've we've been writing more and more papers, but. We should focus on the good ones. When you, when you, okay, when you write a good one, everything that you say, it's just like a legal brief, has to be supported by something. Yeah. And so you have to put a lot of data in there. Yeah. And um, I guess most of, most of a, a paper based on data is going to be data. That's right. I mean, they're, the, reading these papers now to kind of to the untrained eye, it's the, it appears in some cases like a foreign language because there's lots of data and graphs that that makes sense, but you have to be trained in these, these sorts of things, to, yeah. or at least spend the time to follow each of the steps that led to it. So it takes a while to read it and understand it and validate what's being said. I mean, you can't just skim this kind of thing. Well, I guess you can. We're in, a, we're in a technological and developed age where many of the easy problems were solved long ago, and so now we're, we're drilling down to some of the deeper and harder ones. So can you give me an example of something that's deeper and harder that you're working on? Sorry, I asked. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So I'll, I'll give you one example. We're working on a, a new planet hunting spectrometer. And the name of the game here is we need this, this planet hunt, this spectrometer, to be ultra stable. We want it to basically not move on the inside at the nanometer level. It's pretty small, almost the size of an atom. and so. You have to figure out how to control the temperature extremely precisely. You have to figure out how to get materials that are uh, respond almost not at all to temperature. They don't expand or contract. And so these are great kind of technical challenges that weren't really necessary five or ten years ago because the spectrometers that we had were adequate to discover the planets that were interesting then. Now we want to go to smaller and smaller planets that make smaller and smaller signals. So we have to use our big, our, the same big telescopes, but with more precise instruments. Mm. How do you do that? Well, you were talking earlier about, about borrowing techniques or collaboration between fields. It's interesting. There's a, um, the whole semiconductor industry, you know, comp making computer chips. Uh, it's based on precise lithography, being able to draw extremely precise lines with light, basically developing a photographic image with a pattern of light that when you do it on this silicon substrate makes computer chips. That relies on holding things to an extremely precise temperature so that the computer chips don't expand or contract when you're laying down the different layers. And we're trying to use some of the same well, that's techniques that have been used in that. The same, even some of the same materials which are developed for this you know, mega multi-billion dollar industry that can afford to do that extreme research. So this device like, you wouldn't just put it on the ground because the ground moves, right? Yeah, so you've got to completely would. isolate it. It's got to be vibration isolated. It's, it's, we're, we're, it's a design project. We, have, we don't even know exactly how it's going to be, but it's probably going to fit inside a vacuum chamber so it doesn't feel air pressure. It's going to be in a nested set of, of thermal enclosures, so it's a, a room within a room within a room, and it's maybe, you know, the temperature stable, the one degree in the first room, a tenth of a degree, a th you know, hundredth, a thousandth. Oh, it's really more exciting. More, yeah. You're get, you getting to perfect. I mean, it's approaching perfect. Well, there's some level at which, you know, you can't, you can't make out perfect. But we're trying to get as close as we can. So <laughs> okay. it's, it's a good adventure. So the other thing I wanted to ask is that a, a planet hunter, you know, you, you're hunting, but you're also doing other things. A scientist has yeah. to do other things. And I wanted to give those kids out there an idea of the other things that they'll have to cope with have to perform <laughs> when they get to be scientists. Yeah, I mean, so at my heart, I'm a, I'm a researcher. That's what gets me up in the morning. I like solving these puzzles. And my day-to-day -day life, I spend a lot of time advising graduate students, advising postdocs, doing a little bit of time for my own research. But I also, I teach, um, teach astronomy classes. Do and you I teach try to those general courses that, that anyone can take? I haven't taught any of those yet. I've taught some undergraduate and graduate courses, okay. uh, but for specialists so far. Don't rule it out. No, I'm excited. I'd love to do it. It just hasn't happened. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, so I spend a lot of my time teaching, but also the university runs. It, we have administrators, but faculty play a large role in, the, uh, in running and administering the university. So I, I, I do many of those activities at the Institute for Astronomy, where, where we're located up in Manoa. 
What about money? Um, part of your, um, you know, daily grind is it to get money to write grants? It is. It's gotten thing? harder and harder. Really? Yeah. So federal funding is probably the biggest source of funding. We, there's some state funding, but they tend not to go to individual researcher, researchers. They tend to go to institutes and, and UH as a whole. So as a, as a faculty member individually, I write grant proposals to the National Science Foundation, to NASA. Those are the kind of the two big ones. And we, we also try to get some private money, too, from, from philanthropists. These big telescopes are, are handled by what? It's big universities, but it's also countries. It's yeah. huge structures with huge amounts of money. I mean, a 30-meter telescope is what, billions and billions in it? It's a little over a billion. I forget the exact Almost. figure now, one point two. It's, it's not a cheap, you know, it's the first ground-based telescope that has a space-based price. So, and as a result, no one group could, could really handle this. It's, yeah. it's going to be the premier facility of not only Hawaii, but also the Cal University of California, Caltech, China, Japan, India, and Canada wow. are all signing on and anting up big money. And they'll share by the minutes. Yeah, it's shared. And so yeah, you know, astronomers in each, from each locale will have their own slice of the time on the sky. You get, you get a slice? You know, the University of Hawaii, uh, we will get time on the 30-meter telescope. But after all, you're running the place up there. And yeah, it's, it's, this is the, the <laughs> rent that gets paid, I guess. <laughs> this, is, this is the benefit yeah. of managing the place. Well, it's, it, frankly, it's why you know, I came here and many other astronomers came to Hawaii is because we nucleated this center. There's 35 or 40 faculty, all uh, were, were a little bit bigger than you would expect for a kind of medium-sized state university. And it's because we have this natural gift of Mauna yeah. Kea that's brought all the telescopes and everybody else here. Very important. We have to appreciate it. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Sometimes I don't think we do enough. It's, a, it's an incredible place. Yeah. So my last question for you is, uh, is, you know, what are, what are the, the, the challenges of taking IFA to the stars? I mean, if you, you know, if you, you have, you collectively at IFA have dreams of, you know, enormous projects, enormous successes, you know, relying on the telescopes of Mauna Kea and, and, and the community here, but what stands in the way of doing everything you want to do? That's a good, that's a good question. You know, in many ways, I, I'll, I guess I'll challenge your question a little bit and say we could use more support always. We could use more telescopes. But in many ways, we're succeeding. And a lot of that is because of this great engagement with the state of Hawaii. The 30-meter telescope is going to be this incredible premier facility, you know, maybe the best in the world. The existing telescopes, the Keck telescope, Subaru and Gemini, they're also extraordinary. And on Maui, we see the same thing. So I. I I guess I won't entirely take your bait. And no, it's OK. <laughs> All right, good, good. You knew it was bait. Well, I, I, I'd like to say that I went uh, last year to the uh, IFA open house. Oh, good. There, there was a spectacular success. And people came from all over the place. People, and I ran into people I knew. And I said, you, are you studying astronomy? He said, no, I'm really interested. And uh, he says, people have not, a doctor. What yeah. has he got to do with that? And yet he's down there because he's interested. And I think the community in large part supports IFA for that reason. It's, it's every kid's dream. Yeah, people uh, connect with astronomy. You know, yeah. it's, it's interesting there are amateur astronomers, but you don't hear about amateur chemists or amateur mathematicians. Or you hope you don't. <laughs> they know where the Big Dipper is. Yeah, and so we, people, people understand the idea that we live on a planet orbiting a star, and there might be other planets and stars. There are other planets and stars out there. But when they come by the thousands on open house, you know, and they're, you know, they're just covering, you know, all your your courtyard space there, and just all over the place. Aren't aren't you a little concerned that among them there could be some aliens <laughs> who are trying to slip in, <laughs> trying to scout us out? <laughs> That might explain a few things I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Howard, astronomer, professor at IFA Institute for Astronomy. This is research at Manoa here on Think Tank. We're talking about tales of a planet hunter. We're not finished. There's more to come. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks Appreciate so much. It, Andrew. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs> Good to be here.